tonight. Take your Bibles, remain standing. Let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, we'll look at just three verses, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, it's a long psalm, uh, probably, I don't know if it's maybe the second longest song, I'm not sure, uh, Psalm 119 being the longest, but it, there's a lot of verses there, but we're going to look at just uh, a couple of verses. I'll give you history of this psalm, why it was written, and uh, it's a whole different message. We could preach on it, but it's certainly a good one. Uh, but Psalm 78, Psalm 78, and uh, notice in verse 6, 7, and 8, the Bible says that that generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God, not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. He gives three-point outline for parents and grandparents of what to do with the next generation. That's not the message, but it's right there. Uh, first important thing to keep them uh, focused on is their hope in God. And uh, then the works of God, don't forget the good that God's done, miracles, and then keep the commandments of God. Then verse 8, it might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. That phrase there, uh, their spirit, their spirit was not steadfast, uh, jumped out uh, in the preparation of this. And we're going to build on that thought as well as the heart that was not aright. As we talk about our walk with God, a spirit that was not steadfast with God. Father, thank you uh, for the word of God. Give us some truths tonight that will help us in our study of how to walk with you and improve our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you can be seated. I've entitled the message tonight, Guarding My Walk with God. Guarding My Walk with God. And uh, we'll look at, we'll see how far we get through tonight. But it, it's important that there's something valuable uh, in your life, you're going to guard it. And uh, there's things that are all very important to you and to me, and, and uh, some things that are not important, we don't care if they get stolen or not. So like the old car, uh, you leave outside with the windows down, the keys in the car, and the sign saying, please take me, you know, and, and uh, maybe get something on the insurance. And some things are just not valuable to us, and uh, we're hoping to get rid of them. Other things, though, that are valuable, uh, we guard them, we protect them. And uh, we put on the effort out to, uh, to protect him. Psalm 78, uh, as I mo mentioned a moment ago, is a very, very long psalm. And uh, it records the history of Israel from Egypt all the way till David. Uh, so it records, summarizes the history in those pages there from Egypt all the way to David. The psalm highlights two important ingredients in Israel's history. Two key points are sort of um, repeated throughout the, the, the psalm. Uh, the first uh, area that's highlighted concerning the history of Israel from Egypt to, da to David uh, is a repeated disobedience and ingratitude of the Israelites uh, continually over and over. And we've studied it before, but there's that cycle. And they repeat that cycle over and over again where they served God, they loved God, and God blessed them, and then they took the blessings for granted, and they began to take credit for the blessings. And all the way through, they rebelled against God, walked away from God. God raised up uh, chastening to come, usually other nations would come to their uh, vicinity and would uh, wipe many of them out, get their attention, humble them. God would raise up judges to come preach repentance, get back with God. They get right with God, and God would begin to bless. And that was a cycle you'll see all through the Old Testament multiple times. It just went happened over and over again. Well, in summarizing the history, that was one of the things that uh, Psalm 78 folks on is the repeated disobedience and the ingratitude of the Israelites. But the second point uh, that is neat how it's intertwined uh, in this uh, history, uh, rec record, record of history uh, of Israel, is the reoccurring and unfailing mercy of God to the disobedient nation of Israel. And, uh, you know, with the disobedience came mercy. With the disobedience came forgiveness. With the disobedience came the grace of God. And so we see through Psalm 78, as you study that maybe this week, and uh, isolating those two key ingredients, they disobeyed God. They rebelled against God. They turned their back against God or turned their heart against God. And, and then God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's grace and God's restoration, all of those things are key together. So it's not simply a, a recounting of historical events, uh, but there's some real life lessons that we can learn. You know, the Bible talked about in, the, in Corinthians says these uh, things that were written uh, for, for what are learning. And uh, so history uh, is for us to learn from. So we don't repeat the same mistakes. Doesn't mean that history is infallible. Uh, doesn't mean the, the people that lived uh, years gone by uh, were perfect. But we can learn from historical events and learn some vital truths. And the same thing here is a result. And so this psalm, uh, in one sense, is almost a little bit depressing uh, because it talks about the stubbornness and the rebellion of Israel. And it really reveals the condition of our own heart. 
Uh, you know, another passage of the Bible says, you know, can't follow your heart. Our generation today, uh, movies and everything is what? Follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart. And uh, you look at the Bible, and it says don't follow your heart. Uh, why? It's desperately wicked. It's going to deceive you. It's going to pull you in the wrong direction. And, and so we see something that's almost a little bit uh, depressing as we look at the stubbornness and rebellion of Israel that's symbolic of us or typifies us in our own hearts. But at the same time, the psalm inspires hopes uh, hope and, and uh, helps it for the sinner uh, by, ch by showing them how long-suffering and merciful and kind God is. Uh, it doesn't mean we abuse the mercy of God, uh, but we certainly uh, push many of, many of us, uh, I think at times, push it to the limit for sure. And, uh, but what a great theme and, and, uh, of encouragement that God's love for us. And so the history is not just relating to facts. Nor is it justifying the men or the deeds that were done. Uh, there are lessons to be learned from history so that we don't fall in the same type of sins as before. Uh, and we want to learn from that. As you read this psalm, you'll have noticed that the overriding concern of the psalmist is the children, that they would know the history, their history, and that they would be taught that history. Uh, and if they would not, and you say, well, what was the reason? Why, why is that so important? Uh, because if they're not taught history uh, in regards to where they came from, uh, then they'll turn to apostasy. They'll begin to stray away from the foundational uh, truths and principles that founded uh, the nation of Israel. And so uh, the psalmist's concern here is to make sure that there's uh, the, uh, the concern of teaching that next generation. He's concerned for the instruction so that the children remain faithful. And that's a responsibility of every generation. Number one responsibility is that we individually walk with God and that we then teach the next generation how to walk with God uh, because we're not always going to be on the scene. They can watch us for a while. Uh, we can be a template to some extent that they can look to and follow. Uh, but we're, we're not going to be there long. Uh, our life is passing. And so we want the next generation to know what it means to walk with God. We don't want them to fall into apostasy and a compromise and liberalism. We want them to go the right course. And so the psalmist here is concerned, as it says in our verse, that there's a generation that set not their heart aright. Talking about their fathers and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. And so we see this generation that was uh, preceded this next generation. He said, you don't want to do what your dads did. Uh, they did not have a heart that was aright. They didn't have a spirit that was steadfast. And uh, every generation will begin to decline very quickly uh, unless there's a re-enlistment or a renewal of that recommitment. And so from this psalm, we're going to learn how important it is for us to guard and to protect our walk with God. And if I don't guard my walk with God, it's going to not only have an effect on me, but it's going to have an effect on my generation, my children, and the grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So we've got to make sure that we're doing everything that we can. Number one, have a walk with God. There's nothing to guard. Uh, you can't guard your walk with God if you don't have one. So you've got to start with a walk with God. And that's our, that's our desires. We're looking at, at following on our walk with God for the theme this year. But uh, we want to grow in this area of walking with God. But we also want to guard what growth we make. And uh, what progress you make in your Christian life, you want to guard it and to protect it. Because every bit of progress that you and I make in our Christian life, do you think Satan uh, likes that? Do you think Satan is, is pleased when we're making progress in our walk with God, our service to God, our dedication to God, our commitment to God? Not at all. So when you are progressing, we've got to know the importance of guarding that progress that's been made. Make more progress. Guard it. Make more progress. If we don't guard it, then we're going to begin like this generation their heart was not aright. Their heart was not aright. And, uh, and then the Bible says their spirit was not fit steadfast. So with that, sort of as an introduction, a quick introduction of Psalm 78, uh, let me give you some, um, some guidelines tonight of uh, things that we can learn on how to guard, how to protect your walk with God. Number one, you've got to guard your walk with God by guarding your heart. You've got to guard your walk with God by guarding your heart. The Bible says a generation that set not their heart aright, that set not their heart aright. In Proverbs 4, 23, the Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The word keep there is a military term. 
uh, it's a protection, it's a guard. As you would put out, out, a, out a guard to, to protect a military base, you put out a, a security guard uh, to protect a business or something. God says, I want you to keep, I want you to put up some guard, uh, guard rails. I want you to put up some protection to guard your heart. The Bible says, for out of it are the issues of life. And so uh, we don't guard, as I said a moment ago, we don't guard worthless things. I take my garbage out on Sunday night. Our garbage comes on Monday, and I'll wheel the garbage out on Sunday night, and I don't put a lock on the, uh, the container lid of the garbage. Uh, I don't lock it up. I'm the, and it stays out there all night uh, with unguarded, unprotected. Why? Because there's nothing in there of value. There's nothing in there uh, worthwhile. As you learn on Sunday, I've even put things out there like mattresses and everything, hoping someone will take some of those things. But uh, I don't guard those things. There's no value. There's no significance. But things that are valuable to us... We guard. Now, if, our, if your walk with God, is, and it ought to be, uh, as I said before, the most important thing that we have that we need to have, grow in is our walk with God. If it's said of our epitaph on our, on our uh, tombstone, uh, like Enoch walked with God, and then we could put our name in there, walked with God, boy, what a testimony uh, that would be, and what a, what a great godly influence we'd have on people we come in contact with if we truly had that. But you won't be able to have that uh, if you don't know the importance of God. Guarding. If your walk with God is not valuable, if your walk with God's not important, uh, if you can take it or leave it, uh, if you have time, you'll do it. Uh, if, if you know if, if things are busy and life is moving on, it's not that important to you. Then you're probably not going to take time to walk with God, and you're certainly not going to protect and, and uh, guard it. And so God says, uh, if I'm going to guard my walk with God, I've got to keep, I've got to guard uh, my heart, and uh, that's a part of that. The two working together. And so as we look at this thought of guarding what's valuable to us. When we talk about the heart, we're talking about the essence of who you are. Uh, That's the core of your being. Uh, That's your passion, your dreams, your goals, your ambitions, your desires, everything about. So it's not talking about the organ uh, that that pumps uh, blood throughout our our, uh, circulation system. It's it's not talking about the organ that's inside of us, but it's talking about the inner person of who we are, that inner being. Uh, It's that part of you that connects with God, and it's that part of you that connects with people. And so that's why it says that if our heart then, my son, give me thine heart, and our heart is what allows us to connect with God, because we'll see in a moment, love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And so God, that connects us with God, our walk with God. And, and it also connects us with uh, other people uh, as a result there of, of that heart connection that we'll have. And so God says that ought to be a very important uh, priority. And so that's why Solomon says uh, to, uh, to do it with all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence. He doesn't say uh, if you get around to it. He doesn't say, uh, you know, if, if it works within your schedule, do it. Uh, he doesn't say, you know, it would be a nice thing to do. Uh, he says, uh, listen, it ought to be a top priority. Your walk with God ought to be a top priority. Your, your heart, guarding your heart, ought to be the most important thing of every day of your life. And uh, your relationship with God ought to be important. Your walk in time with God, it ought to be a priority. And so with all diligence, work and effort and commitment and dedication, the diligence that needs to be a part of guarding our heart. And so God wants us to to do that and the desires and if we're ever going to have a walk with God then we've got to guard our heart uh, which is a part of guarding our walk with God and both of those work together Jesus guarded his time with God as he escaped the demands of the day and the people to be with his father many times you'll find and he went out apart and uh, from the multitude and the crowds and he was alone with God he spent time with God Uh, we see that David understood uh, the importance of spending time alone with God as being essential Uh, he found that his time with God not only was a much needed refuge but it was needed for survival and uh, yes there's times that you meet with God it just sort of comforts us and uh, reassures us and uh, re-energizes us but also it's many times just survival and uh, we can't make it another day without being with God. Uh, We can't survive another uh, uh, crossroad of life uh, without that walk with God. We've got to have a relationship with God. And so uh, we see all through the Bible, and it's easy for all of us uh, to see the the opportunities uh, that we spend with God that come our way to just sort of fade out and uh, fizzle out. And uh, all these different times we could have met with God, but it didn't uh, pan out. And so there's many time killers that rob us of our time with the Savior. And it's easy to get confused of what's important, what's urgent, 
and what's necessary. And you've got to figure that thing out. And that's why he says with all diligence, you better guard your heart. And if your walk with God's valuable, then you're going to do everything you can to guard that time, that place, that encounter with God, because it's valuable, it's important to you. And uh, is it necessary? Yes. Uh, but we need to uh, prioritize it from what's important, what's urgent, and what's necessary. Sad to say most of our lives are lived on what? The urgent. The squeaky wheel gets the most attention. And uh, the thing that sort of uh, irritates or bothers or, or uh, re repetitive uh, often gets the, uh, the, the thing there. And so when Solomon says to keep thy heart with all diligence, he implies that you're living in a combat zone. And in that combat zone, there's always casualties. And so you need to understand that. We're not, and we're talking about casualties of what? Your walk with God. And uh, you better, listen, long before your life messes up, you were casually in your walk with God. Long before you went down the wrong path, uh, you're, you were casually in your walk with God. And so he said, listen, there, there, you've got to guard your heart. And if you don't guard your heart, uh, it's a combat zone. The devil's going to do everything he can to mess up your walk with God, to distract your walk with God, uh, to allow you not to have time for your walk with God. And if you're not walking with God, then there's going to be a casualty and you're the one that's going to be the casualty as a result of that neglect of walking with God and so uh, we see many of us I think are oblivious to the reality of this war we have an enemy that's bent on your destruction he wants our lives ruined. He wants your marriage ruined. He wants your children to go to the devil. He wants your life in chaos and, and wrecked and havoc. He wants your life miserable. And that's the devil as an adversary, the roaring lion, walking about, seeking what? He wants to devour you. And the first object he goes after is he wants to devour your walk with God. Because if you're not guarding your walk with God, then every other area of your life is vulnerable. And if he can get your walk with God sabotaged, it, everything else just falls in the line. He doesn't have to shoot any other bullets in that direction because the walk with God has been affected. And so he especially opposes our walk with God. Take your Bibles. Let me show you why, why he does this. Go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, and we'll come back to Psalm here in a moment, but go to Ezekiel and look in chapter number 20. Ezekiel chapter number 20. And uh, look what the Bible says in verse number 16. And so uh, God, Satan opposes God. We know that. He's an adversary of God. But Satan also opposes everything that is aligned with God. And he also opposes anyone that wants to have a relationship with God through walking with God. So when you have a desire, say, I want to walk with God. I want to follow on and walk with God. The adversary takes notice. He takes attention. He says, I, I, want, I hope you don't protect your walk with God. I hope you don't guard your walk with God. Because I'm coming after you to wreck havoc in your walk with God and mess that up. So if you don't have time to walk with God, you're not walking with God, then all these, uh, you get impatient or easier. You get easily offended. Uh, you become judgmental, jealous, critical, all these other things as a result. But all, where to start? Your walk with God. And so Satan knows he goes to the root of the, 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 the source of the, the root problem uh, is what? To attack your walk with God. Not the root problem, but the root source of God's blessings in your life. And they get the root, your walk with God. Then everything else just sort of fizzles up or, or withers up as a result. Let me show you how Satan works in opposing our walk with God. Go to Ezekiel chapter 20 and look at verse number 16. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 16. Because they despised my judgment. So the word of God was taught. The truths of God's word was taught. They despised it. They didn't just disobey it. They despised it. They hated it. Uh, and, uh, and they did everything they could to keep others from obeying the commands of God. And they, the Bible says, and walk not in my statutes, but what? Polluted my Sabbath. And notice the key, where did it start? For their heart, their heart went after their idols. And so where does backsliding start? In the heart. Where's the, where's, the, where's the closeness of God start? In the heart. And that's why it says, My son, give me thine heart, for out of the issues of life, keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? Because that's a very uh, a well and the very fountain of our life comes forth. And so Satan knows that. And he said, I'm going to do everything I can to affect your heart because that's going to affect your walk with God. So if I'm going to guard my walk with God, I've got to guard my heart. And if I don't guard that heart, then I make myself vulnerable. So the, let me give you this thought before we go to this next point. The greater my desire to protect my walk with God, the greater my walk with God will be. Let me say that again. The greater my desire to protect 
my walk with God, the greater my walk with God will be. And so you say, I want to have a greater walk with God. Uh, I hope that's what we all desire. But if you're going to have an improved walk with God, then the greater you desire to protect that walk with God, then the greater walk with God we'll all have as a result. So number one, I say you've got to guard your heart. Uh, guard, I'm sorry, guard your walk with God by guarding your heart. Number two, a guarded heart is a heart that is a right. A right. A guarded heart, as the Bible says here, is a heart that is a right. The Bible says a generation that set not their heart a right. Now that's one word in our Bible. It's not a right, two separate words. It's one word uh, that gives us a definition. So how do you like having a cell phone that works sometimes? How do you like that? And you come out in this pocket here, if you're T-Mobile, uh, there's a pocket of no signal whatsoever. Now, eventually, one of these days, we'll have good signals here. But uh, from here to Longleaf to over, I mean, there's a circle here of no reception at all. How do you like it when your cell phone works sometimes? How about this? How about a car that starts sometimes? Most of the time it starts, but not all the time. It sometimes starts. How about a friend who is a friend sometimes? Uh, what do you think of a Christian who acts like a Christian sometimes and does what a Christian is supposed to do sometimes? Uh, nobody likes and nobody appreciates an inconsistent sometime anything in our lives. We want it to be dependable. We don't want the stove to work sometimes. We don't want the air conditioner to work sometimes. We don't want the uh, car to work sometimes. We want it to work all the time. And God's no different. Uh, God says, I want you also to be consistent. I want you to have some uh, 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 steadfastness about you. And so uh, when we see this word, uh, a right, uh, according to the Bible, we see that the need to nurture the quality of steadfastness. Now, the word steadfast uh, is uh, used in this verse when it talks about a spirit being steadfast. But we also see the word aright. The word aright means stable, steadfast, fixed, fashioned. All right, let me say it again. That word aright means a heart that we're talking about the opposite they say your fathers didn't have a heart that was a right your fathers did not have a spirit that was steadfast so he's rebuking them so we can say the opposite if we have a heart that's a right that's a good thing if we have a spirit that's steadfast that's a good thing in regards to learning how to protect our wealth of god so a right means to be stable steadfast fixed or fashion and so one of the things that's lacking in the generation today is a, in this generation is a steadfastness of Christianity. It was lacking even in the days here when he says your fathers uh, weren't, uh, their hearts weren't right, their spirits uh, weren't steadfast. And so many are looking for a convenient Christianity than truly committing themselves to the things of God. There's a lot of fence walkers. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are just sort of walking the fence and saying, well, I'll, I'll walk with God occasionally and I'll walk with the world occasionally, I'll do what I I want back and forth. And so there's a convenient mentality that we often have. Very few are, are, are willing to be steadfast in their commitment to God. Very few Christians are willing to be steadfast, having a heart aright in regards to uh, their beliefs and how they live their lives and the direction they're going in their lives, to have a heart that is stable, uh, as the Bible says, fixed, fashion, uh, uh, steadfast are all words that would go with that word aright. Uh, very few are willing to remain steadfast. God is looking for Christians who are firm in their faith, firm in their convictions, and who are steadfast, consistent in their walk with God. That's what God's looking for. But how are you going to have a firm, uh, consistent faith? you got to have a walk with God that's consistent. How are you going to have convictions that are firm and unchanging? You've got to have a stable. Uh, your heart has to be aright. 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, we see that word steadfast. He says, brethren, please be steadfast, unmovable. I don't want you to be tossed to and fro and you're just sort of bannered back and forth. And the last person you talk to, you believe that. And the last book you read, you believe that. And the last, iPod, the last podcast you listen to, you believe that. And the last list you're over here, you're back, back and forth. And there's no stability at all uh, in your life. And so steadfastness explains one willingness to continue to follow and to believe even when they acknowledge that the outcome of their lives is not going to be sunshine and roses. They realize it's going to be tough. They realize 
realize they're going to be in the minority. They realize they're going to be the remnant. But they're steadfast and they don't allow what everybody else is doing or not doing to determine what they're going to do. They recognize that the journey that is going to be rough, it's going to be a journey that sometimes will be isolated and alone. But if you're walking with God, you have a heart that's arrived and a spirit that's steadfast, you'll make it to the end of that journey where God can one day say, well done, thou good and what? Faithful, steadfast, committed, dependable servant of God. And those words all interrelate and work together. And so a steadfast Christian will remain resolved in their faith and convictions. Oh boy, there's nothing more important for us as the church uh, as folks stray away over the years and uh, they come back years later. Well, they want to be able to come back to a place that just believes the same way they always believed and still preaches the same way we always preach and still live in the same way we've always lived and still inside the thing we still inside. Why? That's a security that we give folks and it's unchangeable. It stayed the same. There's no security in the changes that take place in our Christianity today. And so the psalmist writes of having a heart that's fixed Fixed on God all throughout the Word of God. Look at these quick verses here, if you would, for me, real quick. Go to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, talking about a fixed heart. What's a fixed heart? It's unmovable. It's unchangeable. It's steadfast. It's anchored. Uh, it's stable. It's not fluctuating. It's firm. It has some convictions and it's going to stand and live and die by those convictions. A heart that's fixed. Psalm, 50, Psalm 37 and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 57. Psalm 57 and uh, verse Number seven, 57, seven. The Bible says, my heart is fixed. Circle that word, fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. Again, he repeats it. I'm going to sing and give praise. What's it saying? i got a fixed heart. Uh, what's it mean? Circumstances may come and go. Uh, good may come, bad may come, but my heart is fixed. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to thank God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to sing to God. I've got a heart that's fixed on God. That's the focus of our fiction. Go to Psalm 108. Our heart is fixed on that. Psalm 108 and verse number 1. Psalm 108, verse 1, the Bible says, Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praises, uh, praise, even with, thy, with my glory. And again, he says what? My heart is fixed. Notice how it's tied again. Sing, praise. Listen, happy people have their heart fixed. And the joyful people have their heart anchored. It's not fluctuating. It's not back and forth. It's fixed. It's anchored. Look in Psalm 112, verses 7. In verse number 8, Psalm 112, verses 7. In verse number 8, the Bible says, it says, uh, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? Why is he not afraid? His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his day. He said, listen, his heart's established. His heart's fixed. And what's that going to mean? He's not afraid. And so a fearful heart is an unfixed heart. It's back and forth and back and forth. There's no anchor to the heart. And God says when your heart is fixed and steadfast and anchored, there's going to be praise. There's going to be a song in your heart. But there's also going to be an elimination of that fear on your life. And so what is, what's your uh, heart fixed upon? Your heart's fixed upon something. Uh, it's focused upon something. Uh, are you firmly establishing upon God and the Word of God? Or are you entangled with the things of this world? You see, the call to steadfastness is a call to just keep on doing right. Keep on speaking right. Keep on thinking right. Keep on living right. Be steadfast. Listen, anyone can make adjustments and change and compromise. But listen, where's those few remnant that says, listen, I'm standing in the gap. I sought for someone to stand in the gap and I found no one. Why? Because their hearts weren't fixed. They weren't anchored. They weren't established. And uh, we need some anchored, steadfast, established Christian. No matter what anyone says, no matter what anybody does, no matter what happens in your life, even if you're the only one doing it, you're steadfast and true. So, that, so we see the importance of guarding our walk with God. So I said number one, if we're going to guard, we'll just get this last point here, we'll be done. Guarding your walk with God means what? Guard your walk with God by guarding your heart. Guard your heart is a heart that is a right. It's established. It's anchored. It's, 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 it's rooted and grounded. Number three, how do you guard your walk with God? Separation serves to protect my walk with God. Separation serves to protect my walk with God. I quoted the verse a moment ago. I want you to look at it about uh, loving the Lord thy God through your whole heart and soul and mind. Go to Matthew chapter 22. 
Matthew chapter 22, separation. So we're talking about guarding your walk with God. How do you guard your walk with God? Well, I've got to guard my heart. If I'm going to guard my walk with God, I've got to guard my heart. Because that's, that's what allows me to connect with God. And if I'm going to guard my walk with God, I've got to do what? I've got to make sure my heart's all right. It's established. It's fixed. It's rooted. It's grounded. It's stable. Uh, it's anchored. Uh, thirdly, I have to understand if I'm going to guard my heart, separation serves uh, to protect my walk with God. Matthew 22, verse 36, 37, 38, the Bible says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And we know that next verses they continue. The second is like, unto it, love your fellow man. You know those there? Now, let's take that thought where it says, I want you to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, that great commandment. Some gardeners, and maybe uh, if you have a garden, some gardeners, if you were out here, you would certainly need this. There's a lot of rabbits and uh, rodents and things. But uh, some people that are they're serious about their garden, uh, they have to put up maybe a, a chicken wire fence sometimes. Uh, maybe they have to put some kind of a barricade or some kind of a, uh, some type of a protective um, wall of some type of, of uh, fencing or something to protect the rodents from getting into the, the garden. And I remember we had a bit, we used to live in uh, Colfax and we had a huge, huge garden and uh, we had just tons of stuff. But we had in that um, region, there was a, a walnut uh, orchard right behind us, about 80 acres of walnuts. And in the nighttime, uh, there's mountain lions that would come in and you'd see their big paw tracks. Uh, and then across the, the 80 acres orchard uh, was a cat woman. And she probably had, I don't know, probably 100 to 120 cats. I mean, and so the, that's why the mountain lions were always around there, you know, because they would often, uh, I'd see the carcasses and things. I was just look at, but uh, we had the, the mountain lions would come in, they'd come into the garden, and we'd have other, a lot of rabbits and jackrabbits and things coming in. And so Dad had the idea, we're going to go ahead and build this thing and, and uh, try to build up a wall and build up some type of a fencing to keep uh, the, uh, the animals out. And so as we did that, the barrier is very important in protecting a garden, but it's not the most important. The garden is. But you'll have no garden if you don't have a barrier. You'll have no garden if you don't have a barrier. And so the simple picture helps us to put a perspective on what biblical separation is. Whether speaking of separation from the world or whether speaking of ecclesiastical separation, which is separation from those who are like, not like-minded in regards to uh, their belief and their faith. Separation is important, but it's not the most important. Your walk with God is the most important. But just because something is not the most important does not mean that it's not important. That fence around the garden is not the most important. The garden is. The, the vegetables are. The strawberries are. That's the most important. But you won't have a garden if you don't protect Standards is that which, separation is that which protects, the wall is that which protects that which is important, which would be the garden. What's the most important thing that we can do as a child of God? Our walk with God is the most important thing. And so separation is important, but it's not the main thing. It serves to protect the main thing. If I don't understand the importance of separation, then I don't understand the importance of protecting my walk with God because separation is a vital ingredient to protecting my walk with God. Is it the most important? Not at all. My walk with God is the most important. But it allows me to protect what's most important to me. And if I don't have separation, and if I don't have those walls built up in my life, I will not be protecting my walk with God. Uh, you see, the main thing is your relationship with God. The main thing is your walk with God. Loving Him, the Bible says, with all your heart, with all your soul. Well, God says, I want, I, that's the main thing. That's the main thing is loving God. Uh, but the walls that must be built, my son, give me thine heart. But you got to guard your heart so you can give your heart to God. If the world has your heart, you've not put up some protective barriers to protect your heart, then God has no heart to be given uh, from you because you've allowed everybody else access to your heart and you've not protected your heart just for God. And so God says, all right, the main thing in the Christian life is my relationship with him. That's the most important. For anybody to say anything is more important than that uh, is not interpreting Scripture properly. But just because something is less important than your walk with God 
doesn't mean that that which is less important is not very important, especially if it comes into protecting your walk with God. And so if I understand how valuable my walk with God is, I'm going to recognize I need to do everything I can to protect my walk with God. So the main thing is your walk with God, loving God with all your heart and your soul and your mind, trusting God, glorifying God. That's the main thing. Separation provides barriers to protect my relationship from harmful influences that will hurt my walk with God. That's what separation does. Uh, because Satan doesn't want me to have a walk with God. And so Satan's going to bring uh, things into my life that are going to affect my walk with God. And I've got to guard it. I've got to protect it. And a part of protecting that is I have to have some boundaries. I have to have some walls. I have to have some fences established. I have to have uh, some things that can protect my walk with God. And if I don't protect my heart for God, to love Him with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. Listen, that's my heart, my emotions, my feelings, my will, my mind. All of that, God said, that's mine. Are you protecting it for your walk with God? If you're not, if it's not important in your walk with God, then your mind and soul and emotions and heart. Someone has it. And the reason they have it is because you've not guarded it for God. It's exclusively for God. Our relationship with God is the most important thing. And so in all, in all of this, and remember the main thing is our relationship with God. So to guard your walk with God, we must apply necessary separation. You cannot guard your walk with God and not see the importance of separation. Separation uh, from the world and separation from God, ungodly influences and separation from the things of this world. Those are things they're trying to what? Pollute, draw your heart after your own idols. As we saw in Ezekiel, it's trying to get your heart away from God. And long before the actions of backsliding, long before the, the behavior of, of walking away from God, your heart uh, was bent to backsliding. Your heart went away from God. Your heart drifted from God. And that's why God said you better guard your walk with God by guarding your heart. And you guard your heart by, guard, by putting up some walls. And those walls are called separation that are there to protect that uh, most important thing. What's the most important thing? Your walk with God, if it's so important, what are you doing to protect it? Well, I don't worry about protecting my walk with God. Uh, it's just sort of walk with God. No, you don't have a, uh, listen, your walk with God is only effective as you see the value and importance of it to guard it and protect it. Because if you're not guarding and protecting it, then you have no walls. And that you're open and vulnerable and susceptible to Satan to do everything he can to bombard and to, uh, deflect and, and uh, affect your walk with God. And so, uh, so we see then to guard our walk with God is to apply necessary separation. In separation from worldliness, where God's Spirit leads us to put up guardrails in place, you've got to obey. And those guardrails that God tells us to put in place that are outlined clearly in the Word of God, those guardrails are called what? Standards. Standards. And so standards are that which allows that wall to be erected and that wall to be established. And God said, listen, this is going to hurt your relationship with me. And this is going to hurt your relationship with me. Listen, everything in this book, this is a love letter from God of telling God how much he loves you and showing us ways that we can have a greater growing relationship with him. And there's things that we should avoid to grow that relationship. There's things we should apply and do to grow that relationship. And God says, these guardrails that I give you are called standards. So separation uh, are those things that we separate from. Those walls are built. The guardrails it gives us are called the standards that come into our lives. So at any given moment, when we're walking after the flesh or after the spirit, it's the spirit's leadership to which we're surrendered. And because he knows us better than we know ourselves, he may lead us to, to erect specific guardrails. They're designed to protect our walk with God, which ultimately is what? It's to protect our relation with God. And you say, I don't know why God gives me all these rules and all these guidelines, all these standards, and why is separation such a big deal? Because God loves you, and He wants you to love Him with your whole heart. He wants you to love Him with your whole soul. He wants you to love Him with all your mind. So He says, these are the guardrails you build up to protect your heart, which in turn protects your walk with God. You cannot give your God your heart, your whole heart, if it's not guarded. Something has your heart if it's not guarded specifically and exclusively for God. For example, uh, let me give you a verse here. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 5 for tonight. We'll build on this next time. Ephesians chapter 5. Look what it says in, in uh, verse uh, number 3 and verse number 4. Give an example. The Bible uh, warns against moral sin. It warns against moral sin. 
uh, here in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, it goes on, it says, but fornication, all in cleanness, verse 3 and 4, chapter 5, of covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, uh, nor uh, jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And so he tells us uh, some guidelines, moral sins, things that we ought to avoid. Now the issue here is not only not committing these sins, but also not condoning these sins. See, here's the problem. Just because you don't do this uh, doesn't mean that you're right with God and protecting your heart. You're not protecting your heart just because you don't do something that's wrong. You protect your heart also because you don't condone what is being done that's wrong by others. You don't condone that. You're protecting your heart. If you, don't, if you condone what others are doing, you're placing yourself in their sphere of influence to where you're going to become inoculated, immune to their type of spirituality or lack thereof, and you're going to begin to define spirituality based upon what you've not built up walls to protect your walk with God. So the issue here is not, not committing these sins, though we ought not to be immoral in these areas, but it's also not condoning them, not allowing such to be named in a favorable way in a setting under your control. Listen, God says, listen, this is a way you guard your, your walk with God. This is a way that you guard uh, your heart. He says, uh, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you. He said, they didn't say, I want you to don't, don't be doing it. I don't even want it to be named among you. Don't even condone that kind of lifestyle. Why? I'm protecting my heart. I'm protecting my walk with God. And God says, I've got to make sure I guard that. So let's apply this matter uh, to uh, media choices personal viewing habits so if God says all right you're not doing those things but you're watching those things you're viewing those things you're listening to those things you're exposed to those things and it's all wonderful. I'm glad you're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're not uh, uh, fornicating. I'm glad you're, you're not uh, uncleanness. I'm glad you're this and that and everything else. But God said, he said, hold on. You're not guarding your heart in your walk with God if you're condoning this kind of behavior and it's being named of you in your home, in your family, in your viewing time, in your social time, in your internet time. He says it shouldn't even be named among you. And so it's the app. So we see here, uh, the passage of Scripture makes it clear that vile and vulgar content must not even be permitted as a viewing choice. So for you to guard your walk with God, you've got to guard your heart. How do you guard your heart? You build up some walls that are called separation. Those bricks of that wall are called standards. God gives us what those standards are. He gave us some right here. You shouldn't be a part of that uncleanness and, and filthiness and foolish talking. So when you're watching a comedian that's just foolish talking and, and, and jargon against religion and, and, and preachers and this and that, and just sort of using that as a reason for uh, uh, joking around or using vulgarity, and uh, they're talking filthiness, what's that, vulgarity? He says, listen, I'm glad you don't talk that way, but if you're going to guard your heart and guard your walk with God... You can't even expose yourself to listen to that kind of filth and trash in your viewing or listening environment. If you do, then you're not guarding your heart because if it's not very valuable, you don't see the importance. Well, that's not a big deal. Everybody's vulgar. Everybody speaks filthy. Everybody has foolish talking. Everybody has jest. We're just what? Just joking. Oh, and that makes everything okay because we said something hurtful. We said something critical. We said something very unkind. We said something that was very uh, not proper and appropriate. And we said, just kidding. That's called foolish talking. That's called jesting. Listen, that's called filthiness. And God says we ought not to talk that way. So if I'm going to guard my heart, guard my walk with God, I've got to guard my heart. How do I guard my heart? I've got to guard my heart by putting up separation or those walls and standards or those uh, bricks that God tells me in his word like we're looking at here tonight. Just in areas of what you watch on television, these two verses, and what you view online uh, in regards. Listen, as become a saint, you're a child of God. You're a saint of God. You're a set apart, chosen vessel. Why in the world are you listening to that? Well, I don't talk that way. I don't live that way. But why are you condoning it? By laughing with it and listening to it and allowing it into your home. You're allowing immorality in your home through a bedroom scene, but you never be immoral yourself, but you keep watching that long enough, you'll put down your barrier and you'll eventually find yourself immoral with someone else's husband or wife. You'll find yourself. Why? Because you didn't see the importance of guarding your walk with God by guarding your heart. And part of guarding your heart is what? you got to build up some walls. Is separation the most important thing? Not at all. It's not at all. Holiness 
is not nearly as important as the Holy One. Holy living is not nearly as important as the Holy One. But if you're ever going to have a wonderful relationship with the Holy One, be ye holy. For I am holy. It's that standard. It's that separation that allows me to protect my heart and protect my walk with God and build up some walls. If I'm not building my walls around my walk with God, I'll tell you why I'm not. It's not important to me. It's not valuable to me. Because if it was, I'd put up some barriers. That's why some of you wives and some of you husbands, you need to put up some barriers in your home and say, listen, you're not going to be watching that on television. Why? Because you value your marriage vows. You value the sanctity and the preciousness of your marriage. Why? And you don't let you. Well, he watches that kind of stuff. She watches that kind of stuff. Listen, don't allow that. Why? Because it doesn't condone that stuff. You've got to guard your walk with God. You've got to guard your heart as a result of that. And so the issue is not uh, the sins necessarily that you don't commit. But what sins do you condone that you don't commit? You don't say anything about it. You don't say anything negative about it. You even are exposing yourself to it. So it's absolute. This is an absolute verses that God gives us here. Uh, there's how, the, how you implement it may vary. How you build your wall may vary. Uh, some may be led to have no television at all. I know folks, good folks over the years. Uh, and uh, they say, you know what? We're not going to have any television at all. And uh, we're going to avoid the opportunity or the temptation to hear the foolish jesting and the filthiness and the foolish talking and the things that are not convenient for becoming a saint of God. So we're not going to have a television at all. And that's wonderful. Those are great walls that are built. And that's a great wall to build. Others may have the uh, wall that's built to say, you know what, we have a television, uh, but uh, we make sure that we've got proper filters and proper uh, parameters that can guide and protect us from hearing things or seeing things or being exposed to certain things uh, that uh, that would be that or other fellows we're not going to allow uh, this we're putting these different uh, uh, codes on the television so if it's this rated that it's going to block out and nobody's going to be able to access that anyway so you've got different uh, pr parameters or guidelines on your computer filters or whatever it might be what do you do you're setting up the walls and what are you doing you're saying it's not well you can't, can't you trust me no you, that's your problem you think everybody should trust you the problem is you shouldn't even trust yourself and you should start building up some walls and say, I'm going to guard myself. I'm going to put some walls up. I'm not going to put myself in a position of vulnerability because I am weak at best. I can fall as the best of them. I want to guard myself. Now you put up those walls. You protect your walk with God. If you're not protecting it, Satan's attacking it. And even if it's protected, boy, the, the Satan's attacking it as a result. And so the point of this is that worldliness uh, is a, a, a leakage of power. Uh, in one's walk with God. Therefore, you've got to guard your relationship with God. Uh, obviously, each one must follow the absolutes that are given in the Word of God. Uh, they're not up for debate. When God says these are the guidelines, these are the standards, how I want you to live your life. Why is that standard there? Well, you're just legal. No, it's not legalism. It's not uh, your judgment. It's this. God gave us these guidelines. God gave us these standards. God told us to be separate. Why? Because he said, I want your walk with me to be precious. I want to have your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind. And all these things that we think are so in bondage and in slavery and restrictive are things to help us guard our walk with God. And so when a marriage vow is said, and you say forsaking all others to cleave unto each other, you're separating from others relationships of uh, the opposite gender that you may have relationships with other than your husband, and you're forsaking those. You're separating from those. And then you're cleaving unto your spouse. And then you set up standards that say when and how and who and what environment you can be with someone of the opposite gender. Are you going to just hang out and visit on the, the courtyard out there? Are you going to just hang out and be going to park somewhere? Are you going to go on a lunch date with someone at work? Or What are you going to do? What kind of standards are you going to have to protect what? Your walk with God. That's all it comes down to. God says, listen, I just want you to want to have a walk with me so much and it's so important, so valuable that you're willing to protect it. You're willing to protect it. And if we don't see the importance of protecting our walk with God and then we look at the Bible saying, it's, well, that's a judgmental book and, well, that's a bunch of do's and don'ts and everything else, you're missing the context of this love letter. This love letter is God saying, I want you to be able to love me like I love you. We'll never arrive at that goal, but he says, I want you to love me with all your heart. But you won't love me with all your heart if you're not guarding your heart. I want you to love me with all your soul, your mind. 
But you're not going to give that all to God if you're not guarding it. Guarding it. And the most important thing that you have going for us is our walk with God, our relationship. That's the most important. That's all that matters. When life comes to the end is your walk with God, your relationship with God. That's all that's going to matter. Nothing else is going to matter, your relationship with God. It's the most important. But you will never be able to say, I fought a good fight, I kept the fight, I finished the course, if you've not understand the importance of guarding that walk with God by guarding your heart and realizing that separation are those walls and those standards that God gives us of how to build that wall is, is built up around your life. Not to enslave and bo- keep you in bondage, but to allow your heart to be focused to him. And I think we'd look at separation a little bit different because I've said it before, it's a separation from the world in order to be separated unto God. Too often we focus on the front half and say, well, separated from, 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 from. Uh, Listen, holiness is important, but the holy one is the most important. You can be pretty holy, but not have a walk with God and have all the outside things going for you, all the standards going for you. But if you don't have the understanding of the most important things, your walk with God, you're missing the value. Your, Your walk with God is not, the most important thing is not your holiness and your standards and your separation. That allows you to have a walk with God. But if you don't have that wall of separation being built around you, things that are trying to hurt and attack and sabotage your walk with God, then then we're really careless in our walk with God, and we really don't see the value of it. It's like we're taking the garbage out on Sunday night, and uh, there's no lock, padlock on on the lid. There's nothing of value. We leave it open. We leave it all night by itself, unguarded, and uh, we're not worried about it. Why? Because it's not it's not worth it's not worth anything to me. But there ought to be something that's worthwhile to you. It ought to be your walk with God. If it is, which I pray it is, then you're going to be looking for ways. How else can I guard my walk with God? Oh, that's something else I need to do. Okay, I need to implement that in my life. Oh, that's something else I need to stop doing. Oh, I I shouldn't expose myself to that. That's something else. That's another brick I can add into the wall of protecting my walk with God. That's all it is. It's allowing you to have a wonderful, sweet, and special relationship with your Savior and hopefully have it for a lifetime. But if you don't see the value of that walk with God, then you're going to look at separation and standards, and so many Christians do, as being outdated, archaic, outdated and archaic, as unimportant and insignificant, trivial, not, not needful. You, you, you don't understand the whole reason of, of why those separation standards are there. The fence is important, but the garden is the most important. If there's no fence, there's going to be no garden. It's going to be eaten up. The garden is the most important. Your walk with God is the most important. But if you don't have those standards of separation in your life, you won't have a walk with God. Guaranteed, you won't have one. And uh, it'll show over time as we begin to see that passion, that desire, that love for God, that lack of steadfast spirit. We'll come to that next week. Thank you, Father, for the truths that you give us tonight. We pray you 